Welcome to Coyote Baptist Church online worship service. My name is Michelle Parnell and I want to thank you for setting aside this time to be with us and worship God. It's the first week of Advent, Christmas at Coyote, the time of year when we celebrate the glorious first coming of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. We have some great special events planned and you're invited. Just go to Coyote.org, click on the calendar and make plans to come. This season, we give extra attention to international missions, to sharing the good news of salvation through Christ to every nation on earth. This is done through prayer and support of the International Mission Board and Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. If you would, please pray along with us for the men, women, and families around the world who are telling others of Jesus and His love. If you'd like to support the ministry of Coyote Baptist Church, you can do so on our website or by using the mailing address shown here. In a few minutes, Pastor Steve will begin the Advent Sermon Series, Prescription for a Dying World. But right now, join us in singing praise and worship to Jesus.
Welcome to uh, Kaoki Baptist Church online service as, uh, as we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. It is now official. We are in the holiday season. I hope you had uh, just a really wonderful Thanksgiving and, um, and, and ate everything you wanted to eat and have recovered from that. We are now entered into the season of Advent. Uh, the Lord has come and we want to rejoice and praise God for his blessing of a son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so thank you for being a part of this. As you're going to see, that's we start a uh, uh, just a, an Advent series that we're calling Prescription for a Dying World. And um, there's a reason for that. Um, I also want to say that if you are able to get out and about, then uh, next Saturday, this coming Saturday, um, we are a part of, we, we have made a commitment to come along and support uh, Christmas in Appling, and so that will be Saturday uh, afternoon, and and you are more than welcome to come and, and join and just see uh, what happens in downtown Appling, uh, or you can come alongside and help us serve and minister. There are a lot of different opportunities, but uh, we welcome that, and then of course the next day is, is worship back at Kaioki right here and we'd love to have you back on our campus if you can't make if you can't make that then uh, we hope you'll you'll be back with us online so if you have your Bibles we are in Luke the gospel of Luke and we're going to be in the very first verses first part of the first chapter of Luke Luke chapter one and um, that's where we'll begin and I'm going to just read the first four verses kind of as a as a setup for what's happening and why Luke writes this letter. Um, I think it will kind of anchor us for the next several weeks as we look at the results of his research and, and, and study in finding out what it was like when God sent his son. So let's read it. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. I don't know what your overarching guide and thrust for Christmas is. It might be, um, it might be just to celebrate the season. It might be to enjoy the pageantry, the colors, the lights, the music of Christmas. It could be to make sure your children have all the gifts and everything that that, uh, that they desire. It could be you just like to be with family and you like the, quote, spirit of the season. A lot of different things that um, are very attractive about this time of year. But as followers of Jesus, we come and we approach this celebration as the looking at the wonder of Jesus Christ. The fact that God became man in the form of Jesus of Nazareth. And Luke, as he begins his gospel, is very honest with us and he writes, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, in these first four verses, it's kind of interesting, in Greek is actually one long sentence. There's, <laughs> there's no period in here. And, and I read out of the English Standard Version, and they do a good job. They don't, put a, they don't put a period in between any of the phrases either. They just, they keep it running, and that's how Luke wrote it. Uh, he acknowledges here other accounts, uh, but states his intent in writing. He says, uh, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. 
Um, Luke evidently wants to fill in the gaps. There, there have been other tellings, perhaps other writings. It's believed that Luke is the th- historically and chronologically the third of the four Gospels written. Uh, either Matthew or Mark came first, and then next was Luke, and finally John. Maybe he wants to correct errors that have been that have been uh, uh, espoused in uh, these other accounts. M- many and probably most of these accounts he's referring to were oral accounts. That's how most people learn since there was no printing press and there was a high rate of illiteracy. Um, people were audible learners. Uh, there, although there had been some, as we said, Matthew and Mark had, it's believed, have been written by the time Luke begins his gospel. But there were also other written narratives, uh, accounts of Jesus. Um, some of them more accurate than others, but none of them were deemed worthy by the early church to be considered the Word of God, to be included in the canon of Holy Scripture. Um, in Second Peter chapter 1, the Apostle Peter writes that we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means there were cleverly devised myths when Peter wrote that and probably leading up to, people, to Peter's writing that. These myths had been and were being promulgated throughout the church. Uh, So Luke's desire is to provide certainty. Um, He knows that if someone comes to certainty about Jesus, who he is, what he has done, then that person is faced with a personal decision. What will I do with Jesus? If this is true, what will I do with him? There is a reason why Matthew, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called Gospels. They contain, they speak good news, which is what the word gospel means. The four writers are often referred to as evangelists. Luke the evangelist, Matthew the evangelist, Mark and John the evangelist. Uh, what is an evangelist? He is a teller of, of good news. So this is what Luke does. He gives an account of good news. And that good news is Jesus saves. And he gives that account of Jesus and all the extraordinary things that he has done. But he gives them within the framework of ordinary, everyday Life. And the reason that is so important is because we often think God is only, only um, the God of the spectacular event, but not so according to both Luke and all the other gospel writers. Um, we're calling today's message God in Unexpected Places because He shows up in everyday, ordinary, times of our lives. As we're going to see, Zechariah is doing what he was, what his job was, what he was called to do. He's serving the Lord and God shows up in a huge way. So let's look and see exactly how this plays out. Verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Uh, Verse 5, at least the beginning of verse 5, gives us an historical marker for when the things that Luke is writing about here in these opening chapters, when they occurred, when, when he tells us that it was in the days of Herod, king of Judah, we can be pretty certain that what's the when this is happening is probably between the year 7 and 5 B.C. 
All right. Now, you can't read through the New Testament without encountering the name Herod. Um, there are actually different Herods, all of the same family, a family of rulers and governors. This particular Herod is uh, the one known as Herod the Great. Now, he was called the Great, but certainly not because of his character. He was an incredibly cruel, immoral, and murderous man. Um, someone living in the first century would understand uh, by the reference to Herod that these events that Luke is writing about occurred in the midst of very bleak and very dark times. And I want to, if you'll allow me, to just to take a little bit of liberty. You might be living in the midst of a very dark and bleak period of your life. Um, and you may wonder, listen, I don't know what, not just my tomorrow, but what the rest of my today is going to look like. I don't really care. Well, I hope you'll, you'll just grasp the significance that our God is a God who works and manifests himself in the midst of darkness. In fact, if you were to be taking notes, the, the, the first little factor I want you, you want you to jot down is that when life seems dark, God is there. When life seems dark, God is there. After fixing the historical and cultural setting, Herod, king of Judea, Luke takes us down to the personal level. He tells us there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were righteous and blameless before God. Some pretty significant personal information for us to know. This man, Zechariah, was a priest, and he was married to the daughter of priest. And they were godly people. They were good people. They loved and followed the Lord and his commandments. Everything is going well in terms of what we read and know about these two people, this married couple, until you get to verse 7 where there is a but. There's an oh by the way. You need to know this about, about this couple. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And both were advanced in years. And now that may not seem like, um, it may not seem like a disparaging thought for us today. Because we know there are all kinds of factors. But understand that in the first century Jewish culture, the fact that Zechariah and Elizabeth f were unable to have children would, uh, would beg the question, what did they do wrong? Why don't they have children? Why has God withheld his favor from them? Why are they cursed? Why didn't God give them a child? It's too late now. They're old. What happened? Why was God angry or mad at them? Maybe, maybe you've got stuff in your life that you're going, you maybe have just fallen prey to the common conception God must hate me. God must be, have something against me. I must have done something wrong. This is very similar to uh, John chapter 9. If you were with us a few weeks ago, we looked at when Jesus and the disciples walked upon a man that was blind from birth, and the disciples asked Jesus the question of the man, who sinned, this man or his parents? And you see there's a bias built into the question. Somebody sinned. Who was it? And that's what would have been asked consistently of Zechariah and Elizabeth's situation. Who sinned, Zechariah or Elizabeth, that they could have no children? And the answer to the question about Zechariah and Elizabeth, as we're going to see, would be just like the answer Jesus gave to the disciples in relation to the man born blind when he said, neither sinned, 
But this is so that the works of God may be displayed in him. And that's exactly what we're going to see play out in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life. No, but neither one of them sinned. This was of God. God knows exactly what he's doing. In the midst of your personal darkness, God is there. God is there and he knows what he's doing. Hold on to that truth. Interestingly enough, as we continue on with Luke's narrative, it uh, should not be lost on us that um, the names Zechariah and Elizabeth uh, and, and names in ancient times meant much more than they do in our day. In our day, we name a child a certain name because we delight like the name, right? Or it's the name of a, of a grandfather or some ancestor. Zechariah means the Lord watches over you, and Elizabeth means my God is faithful. And indeed, he does watch over this couple. And he proves his faithfulness. Okay, here's the second, here's the second relative um, fact I want you to hold on to as we continue through this, this uh, narrative of, of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And that is that the presence of God reveals itself in the oddest of times. The presence of God reveals itself in the oddest of times. Of times. Verse 8. Now, while he, that Zechariah, was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. The ministry Zechariah had been chosen to perform was to a first century priest in Jerusalem was quite the honor. It was actually a once in a lifetime opportunity for a priest, and that was to burn the incense in the inner temple court. It was not the Holy of Holies, but it was a significant place for the Jewish people when they considered the temple. And so as he is serving and he is lighting the, the, the table of incense, the, the, the candle on the table of incense, the people are gathered outside praying, praying that... Th all kind of things, no doubt. Personal prayers, national prayers. But as he's doing so, all of a sudden there is an interruption of his duties. We read in verse 11 that an angel of the Lord appears. And we read in verse 12 that Zechariah's response was to be afraid. A response that probably if we were doing our job, going about what we uh, do in our occupation, and an angel of the Lord appears, we probably would be a little taken aback, right? It's, all, it's a common response even throughout Scripture of, of godly observers that when um, an angelic or divine appearance occurs... The, the result is fear of the one that is in their presence. And, and I, I can't help but think that the reason fear is the, is the normal reaction is because these appearances um, are so uncommon, right? Uh, they are very rare. And to the finer point, think about it. When unholy meets holy, it is terrifying for the unholy. And although Luke has shared with us that Zechariah was a godly man, he was righteous before the Lord, he, in comparison to God himself, is unholy. 
That's why Isaiah, when he enters the temple and he beholds the Lord high and lifted up, his response is, woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. He's acknowledging, I'm unholy. I am a sinful man. The contrast is quite stark when unholy meets holy. I think it's why demons were so fearful of Jesus when they would encounter him and, and, and afraid of what he might do to them. It's why Satan, though tempting of Christ waited until the Lord was physically challenged, or if you look at the garden, was emotionally grieved, overwhelmed. And even then, the devil was mindful of who was God and who was not. There is no disrespect when you see these encounters between Jesus and Satan. There's a, there's a realization. And so... For Zechariah, he's afraid. He just knows whatever this being is, I am not. I am not. And I would just suggest that whatever it is that scares us, scares you and me, we are misguided when we magnify what we fear to a position greater than God. Our fear magnifies and our faith is diminished when we focus on our fear. All right. Third element that I want us to pull out of this passage is this. The Lord's answer to our fear is always himself. The Lord's answer to our fear is always himself. And we see this play out in a couple of ways. The first way is that ultimately God reveals himself in Christ. All right, this is big picture. Ultimately, God reveals himself in Christ to confront our fears, right? The Lord's answer to, to your fear is himself, to Zechariah's fear is himself. And so the angel explains to Zechariah the purpose of his appearance and the, and, and, and the plan that God is about to unveil. It was true for Zechariah and it's true for you and me. Ultimately, God confronts our fear by revealing himself in Jesus. So let me, let, let's, just, let's just kind of pull this apart. Verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people Prepared. Now that's a lot, and it doesn't read easy. Um, but what is happening is, as the angel explains to Zechariah what's going to happen, you're going to have a son. He does so within the context of, let me tell you, big picture, here's what's going to happen with your boy, Zechariah. This is what God is about to do. He is unfolding the plan of God and how Zechariah and Elizabeth and their son will play such a significant role. I mean, in verse 13, we learn that his name will be John. This John will come to be known as John the Baptist. In verse 14, we see that for Zechariah and Elizabeth, there will be joy in the coming of their, of their son. Verse 15, their child will be, uh, for their child there will be greatness. And then for, their, for the people, in verse 16, there will be a fresh turning to God. 
And then in verse 17, for God's plan, their son will be the forerunner of the Messiah. And I just want to hesitate right here. Because what Zechariah is learning about his son, how unusually born he will be. They're barren. They're old. How are they going to have children, right? But their son is going to play cleanup in the plan of God as to the coming of the Messiah. But they're not the star. John, their son, will not be ultimately about what God is doing. He's, play, he, he's, he's going to play a part. But he's pointing to something greater. He will prepare for the Lord a people. And it is so important that uh, as, as significant as John the Baptist was, and Jesus said there was no one greater, he was always pointing to Christ. That was what his life was about, to point to someone greater. He must decrease and Jesus must increase, John stated as an adult. And I just want to suggest to you that that's what your life is to be about. It's what my life is to be about. Ultimately, our life, this church, God's people are to be about declaring the greatness of our God as found in the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you were created to do. It's what I was created to do. Point, we must decrease, he must increase. It is about him. And as long as I try to make my life about me and get what I want and, and highlight and focus and spotlight myself, I'm going to be left empty. And, and it's like I never can get quite the satisfaction I want. Well, it's because you're going about things in a way that are absolutely diametrically opposed to what you cr were created for. You were created for God and you were created to exalt God, not yourself. So the second thing I want you just to notice here is that the Lord overwhelms our fear with his presence. The Lord overwhelms our fear with his presence. Ze verse 18, And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Now, listen, there's a lot we could get into. Uh, time won't permit. I just, there's a fascinating exchange between Zechariah and, and Gabriel here. And I, I, I don't want us to close without just looking at that exchange. Verse 18, Zechariah says, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. In Greek, in what Luke actually wrote, um, when Zechariah responds, it is very emphatic. This is what he says, I am old. I am old. You're telling me all this stuff, Mr. Angel, Mr. Gabriel. Listen to me. I am old. And in verse 19, when the angel responds, it too is in the emphatic. Zechariah says in verse 18, I am old. And in verse 19, the angel says, I am Gabriel. Ray Pritchett it compares this, this exchange to a scene in a movie. 
when there's a confrontation and the one guy, the lesser of the two, who thinks he's the greater, says to the other, you don't know who I am. And the other guy, the actual greater of the two, says, no, you don't know who I am. It, 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 is, it is telling. You see, Gabriel's whole, whole existence and purpose is bound up. The reason he can say to, to Abraham's response of, I am old, I am Gabriel, is because he is in direct relationship to God. Notice, he says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And it's based on that that I was sent to you to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Yes, you're old, Zechariah. Bear your excuse. Fire away. Stand on it. Be emphatic about your excuse. But I'll tell you something, something greater than that. I am Gabriel, and the only reason that matters is because I stand in the presence of God. Trump that. Beat that one. And I think there's something in this for you and me. What's your excuse before the Lord? Why can't you do this? Why can't you serve here? Why can't you tell someone about the good news? What is it? If God has called you to do something, what's your excuse going to be? How emphatic are you in that excuse? Flail away. God is unmoved. He is unmoved. He is God. And he says, I have and do this for your good. If only you and I had the sense of purpose that comes out of this great exchange between Zechariah and Gabriel. Well, um, let's wrap this up. Verse 24 and 25, after these days his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Um, now listen, verse 25 is not the end of the Zechariah and Elizabeth story, but verse 25, Elizabeth unknowingly speaks a foreshadowing praise of God. Now clearly it's a praise of God, but the foreshadowing comes this. When she says, thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach, she is no doubt referring to the reproach, how that culture viewed barrenness. I didn't have a child, but now here she is you know, five months into her pregnancy, and he has taken away her reproach. Oh, if Elizabeth only knew <laughs> the role that she and her son that she carries will play in a much greater way as, he, as that points to Jesus Christ taking away a much more powerful, significant reproach than not having a child. You think that's a reproach? There is a reproach. There is a stain that we all bear. The Bible, Jesus himself calls that reproach sin. But she will play a role. Her boy will play a role in the Messiah, in the coming of the Savior. On that first Christmas, in order to do what? in order to take away your reproach and my reproach. Friend, I want to tell you, I can say this with a lot of humble confidence that the Lord is looking upon you right now and he will take away your reproach if you will call out to him. And so, just as Luke wrote this gospel, a doctor giving a prescription for a dying world, knowing that if he could give an orderly account and someone would read it honestly, it would leave them asking the question, what do I do with Jesus? We end this opening message asking that question, what will you do with Jesus? 
for Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth and ultimately their son John. They received him. And they held on to him. They ran to him. They called out to him. And he, in a way greater than Elizabeth knew when she spoke these words, he took away their reproach. Would you call on him to take away yours? To be your Lord. And I want to tell you, when that happens, if you will do that, listen, not only will this be your first real Christmas, and it will be more impactful and meaningful than any you've ever experienced, but your life will be brand new. And at last, you can fulfill the very purpose God created you for. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the gift of a Savior. And we are thankful for the way your plan was carried out, including this couple who loved you, who obeyed your word. And, um, And God was shocked when you showed up in the most unusual of times, a day at at work, on the job, and through your angel. You changed their lives, and through Jesus, you saved their lives. God, I pray for every person that's listening to my voice, that, Lord, they would call out to you so that you would save, and you will. May this Christmas for us be a holy one, a good one, a joy-filled one. And Father, we understand that happens only in Christ. So it is in Christ we pray and ask, amen and amen. Well, the Lord bless you. Thank you again for being with us. We're going to close out our service with a song of praise. Hope Hope you'll join in with us as we worship the Lord. See you next time.
that that 